Hi, I'm Tom Ross. We're in Los Angeles, California, uh, at my home. My entry to the music world was uh, rather unplanned. I had uh, finished school. I went to University of Wisconsin for two years, and at SC I finished up, and I was always pre-law, and I was going to go to law school and had gone uh, continuing to enter law school in the first week of orientation at law school. Uh, I was told to get the following books, and I said, is that what we're going to cover in the first year? And they said, no, that's to have for the first week. And the light bulb went off saying, this is not what you want to do. And uh, I left law school. I ended up coming back to L.A., uh, I had had a ski company prior to that where I uh, put together like if you ski one weekend my members get a bigger discount and it was supposed to I told people I had 8,000 college students but in reality I had none but I put together the program then I got the college students and uh, it was going okay it was paying bills but I actually sold it to Western Airlines and then I said well now what will I do and a friend of our family said what about being an agent and I said I don't know what an agent does and uh, he kind of explained a little bit that he they barter deals between club owners and buyers with the uh, talent. And I said, oh, that would be interesting. And he said he knew somebody that uh, he could call and maybe I could get an interview. And about a month later, I got a call to interview at the Agency for the Performing Arts, which is still in business today. And I went in and uh, they kind of told me that uh, they didn't have an opening and they would keep my name uh, on the books and they explain what they do, but not to look at making a lot of money. This was kind of the thankless business, but uh, if I was still interested, when I call, when they, uh, if they ever have an opening, they would you know, keep my name on file. And to my uh, delight, they did call about three months later, and it was November 4th, 1968. Uh, I got a call to... They, uh, they were, APA at the time was the only agency that was kind of involved in rock and roll. Uh, it was just the beginning of rock and roll. Most of the other agencies, William Morris at the time was involved, Ashley Famous. Um, they all kind of didn't believe rock and roll was going to be here to stay. They thought it was a flash in the pan. So APA really had all the rock and roll acts. And so before the phone rang, I was stating that Bill Graham would come down to book his schedule for the Fillmore's. And at that time, the true uh, test of whether you were making it in the music world was if you played the Fillmore East and West. And so he would come and fill his calendar and book. And uh, the guy who ran the uh, department for music was a guy named Todd Schiffman. Todd was stolen to Ashley Famous. They wooed him away, and suddenly APA had an opening, and uh, I got the call, and uh, at that time there really weren't mail rooms where people had an apprentice. They told me to come on in, and I listened on the phone in another agent's office, a fellow named Larry Heller, who was still around, and Larry Heller was just a blessing in my life as I listened, I kind of heard what he did, uh, but he saw that I had a knack for it, and he let me kind of go right past him. I mean, he opened the door to every opportunity, and uh, that's how I started. My very first day, uh, the Jefferson Airplane had come into town for a meeting, and uh, I sat in the meeting just kind of observing, and... Uh, and what happened was I had to be pulled out to go to a, uh, to deliver something to a producer. And uh, the group really said, we like that guy. And uh, it turned out I became their agent. And uh, I represented them for a good 25 years later. 
but that was my start, and uh, I really didn't know what I was doing. It was kind of just hands-on learning, but the basics were an agent is in charge of finding employment. They were basically an employment agency, and you had the obligation to your client. You'd sign each act exclusively so that you didn't compete with other agents from other companies, but you would be able to uh, go to the market and say, I have the birds who are a client, or I have the airplane, and that way you weren't going to get undercut by someone else who said, no, I have the birds. So they made you sign contracts with the artist, and uh, like I say, I started with the, with the Jefferson Airplane. We did have the birds. Uh, we had a group called Poco, which was one of the early predecessors of uh, the Eagles. Timmy Schmidt came from there, and Jimmy Messina of Loggins of Messina came from Poco, and uh, we had Taj Mahal, and I actually learned the business of booking because it's great to be uh, the guy who says, oh, I think this is a big band. Uh, you know, everybody thinks they have golden ears, but the real test of an agent is to be able to book a week uh, everywhere in America to fill in every Tuesday, Wednesday. You had to have relationships with the buyers. And uh, I kind of cut my teeth on an old blues band, uh, a blues group called Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, who were clients of the office, and nobody had called them. They were on Harry Belafonte's tour, and I called them out of the blue, and they said, we haven't heard from anybody for three months. We thought you'd dropped us. And these poor guys didn't work for three months because nobody called. And uh, I, I became their hero, and uh, they kind of taught me... They became my hero. Uh, one guy was blind, Sonny Terry, and Brownie McGee was uh, born with a club foot. And these guys would sing the blues, but were the happiest people as long as they could play their music. And uh, we became fast friends. And then uh, I learned the club business and the college business and uh, started getting a Rolodex of people. And uh, uh, obviously there were other people there that had uh, territories and relationships that I would start to learn the names of the big club owners and uh, I signed Eric Burden. I think that was the first act that I brought in on my own. Eric Burden uh, was a, had a couple of big hits and uh, we we had a pretty nice roster. Uh, Nitty Green Dirt Band, Steve, Mc, uh, Steve Martin was actually a client uh, in those early days doing comedy uh, and I, I was fortunate because my love was music, but I also, they had a client named Peggy Fleming, the great ice skater. And uh, I had, I was the right age, and I became her agent, which was kind of an interesting uh, divergence from what I normally did, but it taught me uh, the business of the arena managers, and it got me into the arenas, and at this time of the business, in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, in the beginning of the 70s, most artists were paid on a flat. The promoter would call up and say, uh, you know, tickets were $3 at the time, so if it was a 10,000-seat arena, you had a gross of 30, they'd pay an act 5,000. I remember we got 6,000. That was a hurdle. That was kind of like a, a big part of, oh, we broke the $5,000 limit. But they were flat, and you really didn't know what the costs were. Uh, we just, the promoter said, oh, I'm losing money. I can't do that. I can't do that. Um, in 1970, I was there three years, 71, I left to go to Associated Booking. Um, because I thought APA was a little old-fashioned. And by then, other agencies kind of were realizing that, hey, rock and roll is not a flash in the pan. It's going to be around for a while, and there was a lot of money to be made. And so the business now had several agencies that were in the music world of rock and roll. And uh, I went to Associated Booking to head their department. And uh, that was uh, the start of representing B.B. King, and Ike and Tina Turner, and uh, Creedence Clearwater. And at that time, they started doing big business. And uh, the arena business started to become a real uh, money maker 
for the music, uh, for the, not only the acts, but the promoters. They started to develop, you know, a lot of promoters were just local people that did parties and then graduated from clubs. But now, all of a sudden, people were uh, very definitely uh, seeing that this was a growing business with a lot of money to be made. And uh, the promoters started to uh, do a lot of tours. They would take people across the country. Uh, Dick Clark was one of the first people that would tour and act across the country. And they would buy them, again, for a flat fee, but they were maybe up to 7500 to 10000 That was probably top of the business. And uh, I would say uh, somewhere in the mid-'70s was the turning point of the agency business, realizing that uh, really there is a chance here to make a lot more money than the acts are making. Uh, that there is a lot more profit than we thought, and the promoters uh, were now going to start giving us what those costs were. And my background, having handled Peggy Fleming and knowing some of the building managers, gave me the ability to kind of find out who was telling the, who was fibbing and who was padding. We used to call it padding the budget. And if they said the rent was 20%, and I knew it was only 10%, uh, maybe it was 10% up to a figure and then a flat, um, we started saying, nope, we're not going to do that. And if you don't come straight, we're going to play for somebody else. And so at that point, uh, the business kind of developed into a small community. There were, might have been 50 or 60 major promoters across the country who did the what we call arena acts, acts capable of doing over 5,000 people. And uh, at that time, you could package anything you want. You could put, you know, as long as you had the headliner, you could put anyone you want underneath them. There were normally three acts. So an agent had the ability to break a new act by saying, I'll give you this tour. And uh, that was a big... Uh, a, a big, uh, a, a big ace to kind of hold out in front of new acts that were getting airplay to say, look, I can deliver the Creedence Clearwater tour, or I can deliver the Chambers Brothers, or uh, all the various people we represented, uh, and it helped kind of put me in a position of being a, a powerful agent uh, and having the clout to kind of see real talent, get together with the record companies, and they say, we're really feeling that this is going to be a big act, we need a tour, and uh, we would slot them on a tour that was compatible musically, and uh, uh, things went pretty well for a couple of years. Business was exploding, people were loving music and going to concerts, and uh, it really became, uh, as more money was being made, everybody got greedier. Uh, in the mid-70s, like I say, they were getting uh, a flat guarantee, but uh, we started breaking down the barrier and were getting percentages. Uh, the percentage was they'd list all the cost and they'd get a guarantee, but they started to make a percentage over the cost of the arena, plus like 10 or 15 percent profit for the promoter, and then we split. And it was 50-50, 60-40. Uh, we kept pushing for more, they kept pushing for less, but uh, as the years progressed, we found a lot of the costs were not really the true costs, and a lot of the cost promoters would charge us for catering, for limousines, were companies that they started and they actually owned them. So they were making profit uh, in little ancillary incomes from businesses that they used to farm out, and now they owned it. Uh, the parking concession used to be an area where the buildings sometimes would throw it in for free, and the promoter would say, oh, we've got to pay for the parking attendance, and they charge. And the business, everybody was making money, so nobody really challenged it. Uh, prices kept going up, and uh, people kept coming to the shows. Merchandise started to be sold. The T-shirts started uh, being a, biz a big business in the mid-'70s. Everything was blossoming. Uh, lots of acts were exploding. The record business was uh, selling lots of uh, lots of records, uh, but 
people had they had a build people didn't just happen uh, on one single they would have to build a career based on the first album and you hope that maybe they could sell a couple of hundred thousand on the first album and the next album people would await and the next album would come and they'd sell half a million and then maybe the third or fourth album they could explode to a, a platinum selling million selling album and become a real dominant force in the uh, in the business um, in 1970 Five, I believe, I left ABC and went to I uh, International Famous Agency. Uh, through this time, there were about six major agencies. There was William Morris. There was International Famous. There was Creative. Uh, uh, it was CMA. It was Creative Management Associates. Uh, APA was still there. And uh, there were a couple of small agencies. Uh, Heller Fischel, I believe, was one of the bigger ones. Uh, uh, the, there was an agency called the Millard, agency, uh, Millard which Herb Spar had started out of San Francisco uh, and worked very closely with Bill Graham and all the San Francisco scene, the acts that came out of there. Uh, so they were kind of uh, a small biggie. And uh, like I said, there were a good half dozen majors. And I went to Ashley Famous, which had a television film department. And uh, they had Chicago, they had Three Dog Night, they had the Doobie Brothers. And uh, I thought, boy, this is now I'm going to really hit big time. Um, and I have real clout behind me and a real agency behind me. And uh, I would say about four months after I started, uh, they merge. Creative Management Associates and International Famous Agency merge to become ICM. And uh, the guy who hired me, Dan Weiner, uh, decided he didn't want to be part of this big public convergence. He left and started a little agency in Monterey. And that became Monterey Peninsula Artists, which is still in business today. Uh, and uh, he was my mentor. He was the guy who hired me, and I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm leaving L.A. And uh, So I was left in an environment where I didn't really know anybody. I was There were three major agents at IFA. It was Danny and Fred Bolander, his partner, and they left, and I was the lone survivor of uh, this big merger, and the rest were all from creative management. So... Uh, a couple of months went by, and everybody was, who are you going to vote for to be the department head? And uh, quite honestly, I was the only one who said, I'm an Indian. I'm definitely not uh, big enough to be the head honcho. Uh, and so while they were all politicking for uh, who was going to run the office, I was busy staying there, getting in early in the morning, because uh, there were close to 100 acts at the combined roster is represented. And I did all the booking. I mean, uh, myself, a fellow named Hal Lazarus from CMA, who was an Indian, and we all just came in. We were getting the job done, and the rest of the, the big wigs were kind of playing big time and saying, you know, I should run this office because I have Captain and Tennille, and I have, uh, you know, a War, and I have this one and that one. Uh, and when the time actually came to pick a department head, the guys on the East Coast, because this was now a bi-coastal agency, this was an agency that was centered in L.A. and New York, the guys in New York said, hey, the guy who we're working with is Tom Ross. So they let me be the department head, uh, but they weren't paying me like a department head. I was not getting my fair share financially, but I was just loving, uh, I was like a kid in the candy store. I was booking all these bands and feeling really good about what was happening and interacting with the managers. And uh, I, I didn't really uh, earlier talk about the artists. Many artists wanted to know what their tour was going to be like. Uh, some people could tour and work every day of the week. Some people had voices that after two days in a row, their voices would go out. So you had to tailor the tour to the artist's uh, ability to be out there and consistently work. Some people work best booking them two weeks at a time and then taking off. Some people worked 
every month, but only on weekends, and some people did real tours. Most did real tours because of the cost of travel. They would get on the bus and go across the country, and you had to book it so that each date was drivable. And uh, the average was 400 miles. That became the uh, kind of like the going acceptable mileage, and that was tough, especially if you have to go from Denver to Salt Lake, which is 600 miles, uh, overnight. But there's no other city there, and you know some of the artists would come in and confront you. <laughs> uh, Taj Mahal, who was a great folk artist, used to come in every day and play his. He had a little thumb piano, and he would sit there and. He said, where's your map? And I said, uh, I don't have a map. And he couldn't understand how I could do it. And I said, well, it's in my head. I know the country. And actually, I did have maps, but I didn't put them out on the wall like he wanted. Uh, but you, that was really one of the uh, abilities an agent had to have, is to know what cities to go to, to find a date, to route that would be acceptable. And of course, you also had to interact with the record company to say, are we doing anything in the Northwest? Is this record happening? Do we have airplay? Do we have stations? Or should we, should we abandon the Northwest and go to the Southwest? And how would you route a tour? Sometimes you wanted to go to the big cities first where the album was exploding and then follow up. Uh, so there are all kinds of intricacies and, uh, you know, if the manager would allow the agent in to meetings with the record company, uh, then it was really communication and you could really make a difference in a career. Some managers uh, didn't want you to talk to the act, uh, didn't want you to talk to anybody but them, and that they would talk to the record companies. Uh, so you had to respect that. Uh, but it obviously was more uh, fulfilling, and you could really do a better job for the artist if you were part of the process. And I think in the early days, managers were protective. All in all, uh, the merged entity of these two big companies, ICM, which is today still one of the uh, major agencies, um, everybody in the uh, business thought, well, we're too big and we're going to fall apart, and everybody was going to raid our acts. And in the 10 years that I was the head of ICM, um, basically we became even stronger. It was kind of like Hertz and Avis are merging, and we became a super, I mean, it, it was really the who's who of the business. We had a lot of clout with promoters and with buildings because we had so many major acts. Uh, we really were doing an amazing amount of the concert business. And uh, things were kind of on automatic pilot. Uh, business was just functioning. At that time, uh, I started to develop my own clientele, and Linda Ronstadt and James Taylor, and uh, Fleetwood Mac was my big client who had no manager, so I had a much deeper involvement with them. As a matter of fact, uh, they were broke, and everybody had said, why are you pushing for this hack blues band that's kind of been a a guest star for years, and I had seen Stevie Nicks and uh, Lindsey Buckingham come into the group, and I just knew that this was the magic that was going to separate them, and uh, they needed a place to rehearse. And uh, I had booked a tour that they toured supporting, uh, I think it was Savoy Brown, uh, but they went on tour, got off tour, and basically maybe had $20,000 profit and Mick Fleetwood was smart enough to put half of that money into buying guitars for Lindsey Buckingham and when they came out with their new record Rumors uh, they needed a place and they had no money they were living pretty close to the poverty line and uh, we used the basement of ICM's building to let them rehearse I said I know what's coming. I gotta, I gotta 
make a move here. And uh, they used to rehearse downstairs. And uh, without a manager, I became kind of like a member of the band. And, uh, you know, I had said earlier that, you know, some bands, the manager buffered you from the act or didn't want the act involved or some acts didn't care about what their schedule was and didn't want to discuss it with the agent. And some were very involved. Uh, but with Fleetwood, it was an extraordinary relationship where I really was part of every decision. and It was very exciting for me, and I, I probably uh, neglected some of my other big clients at the time because uh, I kind of just became starstruck with them. Uh, and we were playing a year of supporting Peter Frampton in stadiums. And now the business had grown to where they were, Bill Graham would put these day, it was called Day on the Green up in Berkeley. And he would put two monster acts together and two acts underneath. And they were starting in May, he'd have like one a month. And they would draw 55, 60,000 people. And I think at the time the, the tickets were over 15, uh, probably closer to 20. Uh, so this was a time where we kept pushing the envelope. How far can we, you know, how much money can we grow? So now we're seeing grosses of a million dollars. This is big business. This is, you know, 15 limousines. Catering was, you know, the, the business was growing in such an amazing uh, amount every year and gross that Everything was over the top. I mean, the, that's when you heard the stories of backstage uh, catering needs and, you know, champagne and no brown M&Ms. And every act had a writer that was probably 10, 12 pages that was just, you know, uh, glasses, not cans. They wanted plates, not paper plates. Uh, and it started to serve the exorbitant, the exorbitant nature of of uh, of success. I mean, uh, when you're living on the road, it's a hard road. I mean, you have no home. So the pleasures that you get out of a bowl of soup, uh, if that's what made your night go well, you got the bowl of soup every night. If it was M&Ms, if it was girls, if it was drugs, it all was proliferating. Everything was going crazy, and uh, everybody was making lots and lots of money. And uh, I think uh, the record companies were making so much money because now people were selling in the millions. And Peter Frampton was one of the first albums, I recall, that sold, I think, in excess of uh, five million. I think it ended up being over 10 million at the time. Uh, oddly enough, uh, albums were selling greater then than they are to this day. Uh, I think probably because the the business was bigger on some level. Uh, and FM radio had to kind of launch rock and roll, uh, which we kind of didn't get into, but there were stations, radio stations were making fortunes. Uh, FM was the alternative music. And every genre of music had, you know, people that were making arena-style grosses. Uh, so uh, the business of rock and roll was a major major business making millions and millions of dollars and you know, promoters fought very hard uh, when people would accuse them of you know you own the limo company uh, it represented a, a major chunk of their volume so if we said we're not going to allow your limo company to be used during the show because you're getting a double profit uh, the promoters said well fine we'll give up these businesses but then they started saying, I, I want other markets. So the promoters started kind of fighting each other at this time for, uh, for the number of markets that they could control to say, I started you in this market. There's a loyalty factor. You owe me. I started, I played you in Cincinnati in a club and then a, a thousand seater, then the Civic Center, and now it's the arena and you owe me. And for a while, um, I think uh, everybody kind of went along with that. I think that was 
part of the involvement of the business that there, there were these loyalties and they should be. And promoters like Barry Fay and Bill Graham and Larry Maggot in Philadelphia, New York was Ron Delsner, uh, New Jersey was John Scher, and there were about a dozen flagpoles out there of major people who uh, the acts would remember when they toured because they were characters. They controlled the city and, you know, they'd get the uh, police department to give you a, uh, uh, you know, uh, from the hotel to the arena, they'd have uh, the uh, police department escort you. And uh, it was real big time show business. And uh, everybody just thought it would never end. And I think uh, uh, nobody questioned anything because everybody was making money. And uh, then the acts started, or the managers, I should not say acts, the managers that were out there started saying, we need more. And the acts were starting to say, I don't want to pay my manager his 20%. I don't want to pay my agent his 10%. I don't want to have everybody taking a piece. So everybody started to tighten their belt sometime in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And everybody was kind of looking to see what any everybody else's pockets were filled with rather than their own. And uh, it, it kind of signaled uh, the beginning of the end of an era. You know, people started saying, I don't want the agent to pick the act who's playing under me. I want it to be one of my friends. And so the agents started to lose some of the perks that would give them leverage to sign other acts. Uh, the managers were being attacked. So the first thing a good manager does is to hire a bunch of people to scapegoat. Uh, if, you, if the act says, I don't want you taking my 20%, the best thing for the manager to do is to say, well, I'm going to fire the agent or cut him back, or I'm going to fire the business manager and cut him back, and I'm going to make sure the record company is, you know, we're not going to give them their next record unless they up the ante. And uh, some of the insanity of greed started to really sink into the business. People were making money now that was in the millions and millions of dollars. I mean, t-shirt business was huge. Uh, the grosses of concerts were, uh, we, we were at a point in the late 70s where the guarantees were twenty-five to $50,000 if you were playing an arena. But the percentages were no longer a percentage of the cost. There was the cost, the price of talent, and then a reasonable uh, fee f uh, profit for the promoter, and then you would split 60-40. 60 going to the act, 40 to the promoter, but he still had to pay some of the uh, cost of ticketing, of the arena rent, stuff like that. And the act said, forget it. I want from dollar one, my percentage to start. And so everybody started tightening their belt, look for a new way, a new cookie cutter. And uh, there were some very creative deals being made. Uh, people would push the envelope and say, well, I'll take 90-10 with no guarantee, or I'll take uh, a bigger guarantee. And they started pushing the guarantees to really an obnoxious level because uh, in my mind, uh, I always believe in a fair deal. And a fair deal is where both parties walk away with at least a smile. And there was no reason for everybody not to be smiling. It was a business that we all loved. Uh, it was a gift. I mean, who? most people would do it for free because they loved it. At least we started that way. Uh, but a lot of people were getting into the business saying, this is big business. And they started moving in uh, with big backers who wanted an X amount of money returned. And what it did is it caused ticket prices to go up at a, at a time when the economy wasn't really able to support it. And when the guarantees for the artist went up, it put a burden on the promoter. If they went to Portland, Oregon and played the big building and only half the building was full, it's not the promoter's fault. It's obviously the act isn't that strong there. 
And when that happens, I didn't feel it was fair for the promoter to drop $50,000 or $100,000 from an act that he did nothing but support. I mean, they obviously had pushed too hard. But the managers had to take a strong position saying, look, uh, Barry Faye got hurt and uh, wants money back. And people did give money back, but uh, if you lost 50, maybe they'd give back 10. Some managers were very, you know, the people they liked, they gave full money back and made them whole. But it started to make the business a little rocky. Some guys were put out of business by bad bets, by shows that were <laughs> bought and for whatever reason they were up against, you know, one of, one of the, the uh, odd issues was Friday night in Texas. Friday night concerts in Texas don't work because you're up against high school football. And high school football is king down in the in the south. So when you got a Friday, it wasn't such a big, and people were, oh, just give me a weekend. Well, you got Friday. Oh, no. So we started learning where you could get the best bang for the, for the date and bang for your dollar. Promoters became a little more cautious, which allowed new promoters to come in. Uh, people with fast money hearing all the monies that were being made in the concert business suddenly you had novices. You had people with big backing who had never done shows before. And the business got a little out of control in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, there were a lot of bandits or people that would put up huge guarantees bigger than what the normal guy could put up, but then when they didn't do business, they disappeared. So some people got burned with these big stadium shows, people trying to match what Bill Graham had done, and you were dealing with people that you didn't know that well, and they had outlays of cash in the million-dollar area, and when they had a bad bet, some people uh, disappeared. I mean, it was their whole life that was uh, about to disappear. Um, but the business had more headliners. I mean, as a whole, it grew, but there were issues. I mean, the record, I think in 1991, the record business kind of went down in sales. There were some tough times. The economy wasn't quite as strong, and uh, it, it was definitely a turning point. I said 90s. I meant 80s. I'm sorry. Uh, definitely in the 80s, not 90s. Uh, so the business had grown to a level in 1984. I had been at ICM for 10 years. It uh, was a public company, and although the music department did great, uh, one year we did great, but the film department had a bad year, so there were no bonuses. One year uh, they had a radio division. Well, Tom, you did great, but the radio division faltered with no bonuses. And I kind of got... And then they had an office furniture division. And there was always something else, and I started to get very frustrated. Uh, uh, I, I, it was too big, and it was always, there was always some reason that a public company had to give you that they couldn't pay you the right salaries. And I had made a lot of money with Fleetwood Mac for the company. I mean, Fleetwood had gone just over the top and had done stadiums. And uh, uh, I felt it was time to make a move. And in 1984, I didn't want to make a move that was lateral. I was king of the hill at ICM, and they were the powerhouse. They had uh, certainly more acts than anywhere else. And uh, there was an agency called Creative Artists Agency who had started in music and film, no, I'm sorry, television and film. And uh, every day in the trades, uh, every week in the trades, you'd see a big red and white ad saying, CAA is proud to congratulate our new client. And in the world of film and television, it was the who's who. It was Sylvester Stallone, it was Robert Redford, it was Jane Fonda. And I said, who are these guys? Uh, I, you know, I, I felt if I made a move to William Morris, that it was just a lateral move and the same problems, uh, it was too big. And uh, I met a fellow named Mike Ovitz, who had started Creative Artist, and uh, we had about a six-month courtship where, uh, as I said, mid early 80s, business was faltering, and he said, well, I don't know if we want to be in the music business, but 
eventually uh, he said, well, you're the guy I would do it with, but we got to decide if we really want to go through with it. And in 1984, uh, 1983, he agreed to do a music department, and I started that in uh, January of 1984, and uh, it... Uh, was a wonderful second half of my career. Uh, I lasted 15 years there. Uh, and at CAA, it really was a culmination of all the things that I knew, all the things that I observed, and uh, I wanted to make it different. I didn't want to see artists go from one agency to the next agency, and it was just a necessary evil. When I had started uh, the Reputate, not the reputation, but the image of an agent was of a balding guy that was leeching his 10% from the artist. And I had always felt that I had made a contribution and that what made, you know, a lot of people can pick a, a winning horse in a race, but the, what separates the mice from the men is if you can do it consistently year after year after year. And I felt I had done that. But if I was going to start a new agency, I wanted it to be the creme de creme. I wanted it to be different, and I wanted the approach to be different. Uh, and I single-handedly picked all my associates, one at a time. We started with only three uh, agents, and we said, what do we need to do to change the business? And what we came up with and what the old Peggy Fleming relationship brought to me is that we're going to have a the, the clients of CAA are all going to be high-end clients at the beginning so I want us to go to the arenas and say look we're bringing you talent that has been to your building 10 15 20 times in the last 10 or 20 years and they deserve a better break than a guy who just flashed in the pan came out, may be hot, but he hasn't been a steady customer of yours. And I said, if that's the caliber of client we have, and we have the volume of clients that we started to, uh, I walked in with, I think, six headliners of Arena Acts, and we were building. Uh, we had Prince right off the bat, who had his movie Purple Rain, and we had Fleetwood Mac, and we had Rick Springfield, who was an arena headliner, and we had Hall and & Oates, we had John Mellencamp, and we had uh, The Kinks, and then we got Eric Clapton. And so the roster was filling in, and we went after the building managers, and I told my agents, I want us to build a relationship so that when we call these guys, it isn't just to say hello. We need to call them now while we don't have business on the table to say, how many kids do you have? What do they like? Just get to know them. Make a little card on each building and let them become our friends. And then let them know that we have these acts, that we want to make the deal instead of going to the promoter and cookie cutting what they tell us, which we knew were lies. I mean, the whole business operated with this, hello, give me your cost. And each time we would play the same arena, they would give us the cost and no one ever really checked it. The road manager's job was to check it the night of, but there were so many ways that an arena could leave out a section and make money. Or you could find out that the attendance was told to you at 12000 but they really sold 14000 because the sections in the back were sold. Um, so all the things that we knew were probably fabricated and that they would pick a number for advertising that was just out of the sky. I mean, they would say, okay, 8000 Well, you didn't really know. Uh, we started really doing homework and forensic type accounting. And the biggest thing, the biggest cost factor is the rent. So we went to these buildings and we got relationships with these buildings and then we delivered the talent. And we were respectful of their business. When we had an act that hadn't been through there, we didn't expect the same deal as we would expect for a Neil Diamond who's played there 40 times or Eric Clapton who's been to every arena in the country 20 times over the years. Those guys, we felt, should get a preferential deal. And... Oddly enough, we were doing it, the promoters were upset. You're, you, what are you getting into our business for? Well, we found out that the promoters had deals where if they 
did over 10 concerts a year in the building, their rent went down. It was a preferential deal that they had. And I said, well, we're doing more business than that. And so we kind of busted the people who were our friends, some of these promoters, but they weren't our clients. And our clients, we had a fiduciary obligation to really do something. And now that we had, uh, that I had this opportunity to start fresh, I really thought we could clean the business up and make it much more responsive to who's driving the truck, which is the talent. And so it worked. It uh, we kept building the roster and we kept making our file of arena managers and we would go to the arena managers conventions and let them know that you know we're not just there to to grind the knife and get the best deal that we had flexibility uh but then we wanted them to understand the nature of why we were asking and that some of these clients did deserve special preference and uh we kind of investigated a lot of the cost areas and brought the cost down and found uh, that we could gross our clients, and that was our selling point, that we will gross you more money with CAA than anywhere else. And for the most part, we delivered on that bet. I mean, we had a couple of situations where we put our, our reputation on the line to say, if we, you know, if you don't come out with a bigger net, assuming business is strong, uh, and CAA went on to represent uh, really <laughs> Madonna, Prince, Mariah Carey, uh, like I say, Clapton, the Kinks, ABBA. Um, it, it was literally the who's who of the business. And we kept getting bigger. And, and uh, I think six years, 1984, we had started. Uh, in 1990, we opened up, excuse me, 1988, we opened up a Nashville office just in time to get into that marketplace. And again, uh, we went, I went down there and explained to people, and they, they were very uh, hesitant to accept uh, an L.A. boy, a Hollywood boy. I mean, Nashville was a very different place. And uh, I had to go back and talk our partners uh, at CAA into opening a satellite office. Up until then, the CAA was all uh, only in California, but I saw the need to actually have somebody in the market that was from Nashville, that was part of the country music scene. And uh, we got in and we really wrecked, we, we created havoc down there and we signed uh, very quickly. We had uh, uh, some of the, we had Dolly Parton to begin with and Randy Travis, but then we got Clint Black and then we got Tim McGraw and Faith Hill and uh, it kept growing and uh, that that business was very instrumental to CAA's growth because it was a lot more loyal. Country business and country radio has not gone through the changes that the rock and roll business has gone through. And they are a lot more of a loyal uh, fan base. So uh, besides being a loyal fan base, country acts were built on working. Uh, as people started selling 10 million records, the need to tour for income was no longer as great. So they obligingly in the 90s did tours just to kind of appease the record company that, yes, we're working this record. They would sell, you know, 8, 10 million records. They made a fortune in royalties. And maybe they would only tour 40 dates because they had to show up, but it wasn't where their money was coming from. And a lot of acts like the studio more than they like touring. It, it, the touring business, it, it, it's tough. The country business is based on touring. I mean, no matter records or not, the country acts have always been a hard work. And the, the average country band probably works 150 to 200 days a year, whereas in rock and roll, uh, not many bands. ZZ Top was one that could. Uh, ACDC, when they worked, could. Um, and these were bands that loved being on the road, but not a lot of the new bands, the Pearl Jams, the, you know, uh, Alternative Act, they did not love being on the road. Uh, so they 
went out and did 40 dates, made a lot of money. I mean, again, now tickets are in the 35 to $50 price tag, and then the Golden Circle started with some of the, uh, not the rock and roll acts, but some of the pop acts, where you saw ticket prices suddenly go to $75. A hundred dollars, and they started the the promoters and the buildings came up with the golden circle, where the first twenty rows were what they called golden circle, and they got a T-shirt and paid two hundred and fifty dollars for the front row seats, um, and that also, although was operating on the greed factor, also created some problems because the audiences, uh, uh, when an act plays in front of an audience. The guy in the front seat is where he gets his energy from. And if the guy in the front seat's a 40 or 50 year old businessman who's sitting there with his jewelry and looking up, uh, it, it doesn't work well for the artist to get them excited that their music is going down. So uh, another facet of what we did at CAA was to make sure that we dressed the audience, that golden circles were never in the front 20 rows. You always, uh, actually with Eric Clapton, one of the tricks we learned is we would hold the front three rows and we would go to the boondocks, the rafters at the top of the building, and we'd bring kids down who were like, they got the cheapest ticket. They were so happy to just be in the arena. And we said, how would you like to sit in the front row? And they were so enthusiastic. And the audience, and you would see a marked difference in the reaction of the audience. And the artist, who's been touring 10, 20 years, that's what he needs to keep him you know, uh, vibrant and to keep it being something that they actually enjoy. And the reaction of an audience is what they thrive on. And uh, so we always had to make sure we were cognizant of when you charge a lot of money, you have to put, you have to do it in the right places. Otherwise, your artist said, uh, "Who is it?" I'll never forget one of the great stories of that backfiring is in L.A. with Madonna. She played the sports arena, and all the front rows were held for. At that time, her agent was William Morris. And uh, Madonna came off stage at the break, screaming for her manager, Who are these idiots in the front seat? And, of course, we knew it was our competitor, William Morris. But uh, she found out, not through the manager. We made sure she knew that, uh, well, somebody put a block of your agents right there in the front. So kind of got us Madonna as a client soon after. <laughs> and uh, I, I think... Uh, you know, as a whole, things were going pretty well through the 90s. Uh, business was blossoming. We were getting more sophisticated. The acts were getting a greater share of the money. And uh, I guess we, we started something that was too good. And acts suddenly wanted, instead of 90% of the gross, uh, of, the, of the net, uh, they wanted 100%. And suddenly there were people out there that were saying, okay, I'll give you 100% because they were scalping tickets and they could make more money scalping 500 tickets for $100 on top of the value than they could promoting the concert by the old rules. So there was a lot of, uh, it kind of for, as the acts got greedier, it forced the promoters to get sneakier and go into uh, businesses that were, perhaps uh, not kosher, uh, not perhaps, they weren't. <laughs> they were stealing, basically, from the arena. They were stealing from the artist. And uh, if they stole from the artist, they were stealing from us. But uh, somehow, nobody would blow the whistle. It's kind of like what's going on uh, in the, the uh, current year with payola. I mean, payola's happened since the early 50s, and everybody knows it, but nobody can figure out where how it's done. Um, scalping was one of the great sores that I had. Uh, it, it irritated me, and I was one of the guys who uh, just refused to let it go. <laughs> and uh, probably it, it led to <laughs> shortening my career. Um, as the, the late 90s came up, the business was starting to be invaded by Madison Avenue. They saw the incredible wealth. They saw uh, some of the success of people that just bought the whole tour. 
In order to buy an axe whole tour, you needed huge, you needed a guarantee of five, six million dollars. And the promoters across the country individually didn't have that kind of money. So it had to go to somebody with deep, deep pockets, uh, big business, and huge financial backers. And uh, suddenly tours were being taken off the agency radar because they would go directly to one guy who would do the entire country. And uh, as uh, Clear Channel started to buy all the promoters, that was what their design was, to buy all these local promoters, buy them out, and then have a national touring company. And I saw this as a huge threat to the agency business. I think everybody did, but nobody knew what to do with it, and everybody just assumed you know, that it would work out or down the line things would happen. And uh, I guess in the year uh, 1998, I gave the uh, year, there's a, a, a magazine called Polestar, they have a big keynote convention, and I gave the keynote speech saying, don't let Madison Avenue come and take over our business. It will It will stop the creativity of the artists. It will definitely thwart the growth of our business, it will shrink it, it will take all the, uh, the incredible diversity out of the business and the genres that we're seeing open up with all, there were so many different radio styles and music styles and they are all doing well and I saw that if Clear Channel was going to take over the business these were people that were more responsive to the dollar and the profit than they were to making the creative process happen and making the staging work for the artist and being responsive to the artistry that built our business. And uh, I was very emotional about it because I really believed that. And uh, uh, the speech was one of the most passionate speeches. Everybody still talks about it. Uh, but what happens to the whistleblower is they often get, uh, they're the ones who get shot. And uh, basically that was how my career ended. I had a chance to be bought out by my partners, which was good. But it ended a little quicker than I would have planned it because I was the one saying, don't let this happened to the business and these guys at Wall Street had much bigger pockets and it did happen and uh, I left the business in 1998 and I think since then the business is you know the, the, the statistics are there uh, that you know it's continued to spiral downward uh, the the opportunity for a radio station to kind of play a local band because they discovered it and love it is no longer there. Everything is programmed on a national basis. It's kind of created this uh, kind of cookie cutter. If you fit the format, uh, no matter whether you're urban or hip hop or pop, the same of the 40 single, 40 songs, 20 are the same, no matter what format. And it's made the business a little bland. And I think uh, where it's going to go is it's going to come back to a lot of independence. You got Right now, four record ca labels. The agencies have shrunk. Uh, you know, there, there's not as many choices there. The promoters have shrunk. Uh, they're, they're now, Clear Channel kind of uh, shrunk that down to, uh, there's two big companies who are now buying all the tours, uh, and, and Schultz, AEG, and Clear Channel. And if you were a brand new promoter, you really don't have a chance to get the big acts because these guys are guaranteeing 500000 a show or better. And that's kind of the, uh, where the business is. I mean, that's a huge amount of money. And if you're wrong, you can go bank. In one show, you can lose three, four $400,000, which uh, the acts don't know the promoters by name anymore. So it's not a, to them, it's just money. Uh, but the the old hippie days of when you knew the promoter and you knew the club owner, they were there with you. They talked about the music. Uh, those are golden years that I don't know. <coughs> excuse me, will ever uh, happen again because 
the, the business has changed and grown, and a lot of it is good. I mean, uh, I can't fault that. Uh, it's grew up, and it, it needed to grow up in a lot of ways. Uh, but I think it definitely uh, shrunk the business at a time that we needed it to expand. And, of course, now you have the threats of, uh, you know, kids being occupied with games, video games, and uh, iPods have changed the record companies for years. I used to argue that you got to put albums out that are theme-driven where you have a cut from Warner Brothers and Capital and Universal and the heads that be said, I'm not going to share my revenue with my competitors. Uh, and they refused to do that until Apple came along with an iPod, and now everybody can get any music they want, regardless of label. And I think, you know, uh, we're going to see what's going to happen to record labels as they uh, are today. They're, they're obviously being attacked, and their business is shrinking, and uh, they've kind of shunned the technology revolution until it's perhaps too late. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the next two, three years will be pretty critical and pretty interesting. Uh, but the good news for the touring business is that as people don't sell as many records today, they're forced to go back and work. And so the agency business is flourishing uh, on, the, on the middle level. Uh, the, a lot of acts from the, what we call retro acts, the bands that I used to book, from the 70s and 80s are making bigger money today than they made in their heyday because uh, of the price of tickets and you know a lot of these venues are you don't have to really draw tickets they're uh, they they play a facility like a casino and they're paid 75 grand a night and that's a nice payday and while they're not selling and making income from their records they're certainly able to continue their uh, creative process and tour and fans that uh, grew up with them are getting to see them live. And the, the, the business of working and touring is certainly thriving. You know, when Ticketmaster came, they took a nice piece off of every ticket uh, for the buildings. Uh, you know, Fred Rosen, yeah. probably a great... That's a great idea. That's a great... Because uh, what he did was change the ticketing business. And it had a major impact because he, what he did is he started and had this incredible computer model and said, I'll build it for you. I will build the computers and put it in your building and I'll pay for it. So what building would turn that down? Saying, you're going to bring me into the, you know, the 20th century and you're going to pay for it. And from there I'll be able to know from all the outlets and I can tell you exactly how many tickets are sold at any given time because it used to be they relied on outlets who would call in I have 42 tickets left oh and then you'd find out no there, no there were actually somebody returned 52 so we had 100 and the numbers were always you know one day you get a ticket count of one thing and the next day it was a half that because you know people thought it would be a hot show and they found out it wasn't and they returned them and stuff like that well when fred came in and said i'll build this on a level where it's all done by computer the first couple of buildings he he uh paid for it out of his pocket once it was working he never offered that again he didn't have to and everybody else had a step into the modern era and they paid for it from the arena you know and uh, he built a hell of a business, needless to say. Um, but it also, you know, people used to line up. Uh, you used to go to the forum, and there were lines, people early in the morning, and that's the only way you got tickets, or you could go to um, Vine, Hollywood and Vine, to that music store. Uh, music well, now it's Music Plus. It used to be, uh, oh, God. You could do it there from the outlets, you know, um, God, what was the name of? I forget. They were the first outlet store, uh, but now with Fred, you could basically sell out in eight minutes, and you know, <laughs> that's what would happen. You'd see it and say, "Okay, roll to the second show. We're clean," you know, and you know, it made it like science. Uh, it was pretty pure. You know, you didn't have to gamble. How many tickets do you think we can do? Well, I'll tell you. You know, there's still people in line, and we've got the first show sold out, so I know we're good for two. I think we got three. Wow. Well, 
I think probably the days that I started in in the 60s, uh, those were the days where most of the people wore jeans and a flannel shirt, and it was very cool not to look at your audience and uh, kind of just uh, turn your back to the audience. Uh, that was the, you know, the hippie... 60s and the Grateful Dead and the Airplane and the Quicksilvers and those kind of bands. But uh, obviously things evolved and uh, that was no... Pearl Jam, I think, was probably one of the most recent throwbacks to the 60s type approach to show business. In between, and now to this day, uh, it's all about a show. It's about having that stage charisma. And to me... Uh, there's a lot of good music out there, but some of it you would rather hear on record in your living room. Uh, and then there were acts that didn't have such a great musical history, but they were just amazing entertainers. And the guy who could get up on the stage and have the charisma to make that guy in the first row and the kid in the back row think when he said, I want you, and they all thought you were... He looked at me. That's the star. That was what made the difference of, for me, the guy totally had command of the stage. And, and there weren't all that many that did, but every once in a while you'd see somebody who you just knew that it didn't matter when the single came, that this guy had such a presence on stage, the single, the hit single's going to come because people aren't going to fall in love with the stage presence and the antics and the charisma and that's a real superstar you know uh, and so you're always on the lookout because uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of acts that had great talent and were great musical uh, achieved great musical events and songs and you know the songwriters uh, James Taylor today lives uh, in as much comfort with his music as he did when he wrote it at the beginning. I mean, there's no doubt that he's one of the true greats out there. Um, to Neil Diamond, his fans, uh, you know, he had a movie that didn't really do well, the jazz singer, but every person who goes to his concert has the same question on their mind. Well, when are you going to act again? That was the greatest movie I ever saw. I mean, he was the Jewish Elvis. And to those people, they can't wait for it. And if you go to Hollywood and say, look, we got this idea for Neil Diamond to go, please, you know, we'll, we're bankrupt already just on the idea. But as a talent and for his songs, his audience, I mean, he's one of the few artists who has always taken a tremendous interest in his fan base. He makes it a, an action. There's a formula and a process. He never repeats, the, he repeats markets, but they're always at least 18 months apart. And he was the last Indian on the Hill to raise ticket prices. He, to this day, is, I mean, he could get 200, his audience could easily pay $200 a ticket uh, compared to others that are out there paying that. And on the on the front of the ticket, not even you know golden circle or special, they the Eagles just finished a tour where two hundred dollars was the top ticket price on the face value. Neil Diamond always resisted that and always charged beneath what the going rate was, because he felt his fan base expected that and would return quicker if he didn't gouge and. and he knows he has a, a career that spans 40 years, whereas some of the artists that are worried about will it all end say, just bring it in. Just, you know, I want it now and uh, I want it my way and I don't care. Um, and, you know, I think that's some of the crash and burn that happened in the industry that people just burn their fan base out. And, uh, you know, again, it's hard to do, it's hard to be creative and follow the record industry's example of every year you got to have a new album that's great you know people can create art like that sometimes you got to wait a little longer and i think uh, you know sometimes you put out stuff that shouldn't have been out but the label had their 
their figures to make. I mean, it was all about the record company's year, and we need one more big record. Who can we go and say, move your release date from January. We want to put it out in November because we need that billing. And that was one of the biggest gripes is that the labels were motivated by numbers and profitability as opposed to the artistry and what's right for a career. And uh, that was one of the things I think most of my clients knew that I was career oriented, that I always looked when they came in and would they, when an artist would give me the opportunity to talk to them about the tour and about their career, I was always looking for a hook. You know, if they said, well, I want to work after the first of the year, immediately I went to, where are we going to be Valentine's Day? That's a big thing. You know, where can we make a statement? Where are we going to, what can we do at that time of year that will make it bigger than just the show? And that's one of the uh, things that I used to preach was underplay a market. If people can't get tickets, it causes a frenzy. And everybody's talking, did you see the show by so-and-so? No, I couldn't get tickets. Next time, you'll be twice as hot. You know, uh, whereas, you know, well, we only got 40 days to do it, and if I can do another day in L.A. as opposed to go all the way to Fresno, I'm staying in L.A. And, uh, you know, the the Eagles, uh, oddly enough, just did a tour of just California. And it ended November 20th, which is why I'm proud to be a Californian. Uh, They played three shows in in, uh, Palm Springs out in the Tennis Center. And here it is, November 20th, 21st, outside, outdoors, in a market that's never had a big arena show in their life. Uh, They have a McCallum Auditorium, which is 1,200 or 1,600 this was a fourteen, uh, twelve thousand seat arena that they cut down in half because it goes straight up. But the acoustics were really good because it was a very big thrust. Uh, you know, rather than be lengthy, it went straight up, so the sound would bounce right back. And they did, I think, nine or ten thousand people a night. They did three shows in in this desert town that never had a show. And they played everywhere else in California. They played Fresno. They played Bakersfield. And they found at the end of, I think they played four anthems and four staples, and there were still 20-some-odd thousand people that paid $200 or 250 a top ticket in Palm Springs, California, that obviously hadn't seen them before. And to them, I mean, this very Palm Springs is very affluent, and uh, they were, it was the event of the year. And where else in the country on a November evening can it be 72 degrees and you're watching a California band play all their hits? It was pretty cool. Well, to me, it was always hand in hand. I mean, they put out a record and people would marvel at the music and, you know, love the songs, but they never connected until you see them on the stage. Uh, you know, when it's, in the 60s, you had album covers that were... <laughs> Your only way of knowing that we didn't have MTV, but is the bass player really blonde and good looking, or is that girl in the band from Heart, is she really hot? You studied that album cover, and the the sleeve had the lyrics, and you could, that was your introduction, and you had to go see the band play live to see it all. Can they do this or is it just a studio record where they used a lot of sounds and overdubs but you can't create that sound live? So you had to go to the show to find out who were the real, you know, entertainers who could pull it all off or was this more, you know, kind of done with all kinds of uh, sound Uh, reverberation and, you know, organs and electronic stuff. Uh, So to me, it was always about the live event and connecting to the players. I mean, it it just brings it to life. It's like from animation to real life Uh, because you kind of always have a mental picture of a song and then when you see it, it it probably changes. I mean, there are a lot of songs... uh, Uh, I remember uh, Kenny Loggins had a big hit, uh, Whenever I Call You Friend, that everybody assumed was about his girl, and it was about his father. 
and you didn't realize that until you saw it live, and said, he's not really talking about his heartthrob, he's talking about a love that's beyond that. And I think that's true for most artists, that, you know, when they write from the heart, you see it when they're on stage, because they feel it, they reproduce it, you know. Um, and to me, that was always the total picture in the true artist, and that's, I think, longevity. Because uh, you just, the the presence, you know, every girl thinks the lead singer is singing to them. When it's on record, you can't really do that. But when you actually see him sweating and you see him rip his shirt off and the antics of prancing up and down a stage or the guitarist, you know, taking that guitar and flinging back and running across the stage, you know, with ACDC doing their circle on the floor and when they're on their back playing guitar... You can't feel that on the record, but you see it live and it just becomes bigger than life. And they become bigger than life, and so one day I want to do that. Or one day, uh, you know, uh, it, it creates, it takes the fantasy one step further. And I think that's always been true. I, I've always said that people always want to see an act live because it just adds a whole other dimension from the record. Sometimes the music is not quite as good. Sometimes the acoustics in the room might alter the sound, but it always is more fulfilling when you see them actually deliver it uh, to an audience because th there's an energy that's created in a building that kind of transcends the music and takes it to another level. And uh, I'm sure most people who are fans of music have gone to a show where they just they just got caught up in the crowd and the music and the event and the social thing and it just became something bigger than life it became bigger than the concert it was like a crowning event in their life where the lyrics suddenly jumped out and said yeah that's happened to me you know i think that's what we're all looking for is that the short answer is yes i still think this is important uh, in light of MTV, where, you know, for, we've now had MTV in our life for a good 20 years, and, you know, the videos got so expensive and so elaborate that it was better than it could ever happen live. So there was a time and an expectation from videos that I think was disappointing when you went to see an act live. Um, you know, there, there was an artist, singer female performer who was a dancer who was kind of chunky and actually live did not move as gracefully as she did on film and video because they could make the shot every other frame and it made it look like she was just floating on, you know, like, boy, look at her jump. And <laughs> then you see a line went, oh. <laughs> so, uh, and, and obviously they can look better and every body who lives on the road has nights or weeks where they're like broken out and uh, not getting enough sleep and they don't look as good. Um, so it, there can be negatives, but I, I always find that there's a real connection to an artist when you see them live that just can't happen from a, uh, a monotone, from a stereo record. I mean, it just completes the picture and you feel right or wrong, you feel that you're getting an insight into his artistry and his personality. Even if you're dead wrong, <laughs> most people leave there saying, now I understand what that song is. Or now, you know, he's really a nicer person than I thought. If you're a band, you got to start locally. So hopefully your high school, your college, your, your playing clubs around town, and you can get by without an agent for that. But once you get past the boundaries of your city and you got to go to neighboring things, you got to spread it. I mean, uh, I was always a big believer in, you know, Van Halen was the local band at the Whiskey. People here said, they're at the Whiskey again. They were there for years. Journey was the local band in San Francisco that everyone kind of had given up on. Fleetwood Mac was like the perennial support band. That It starts and you build and build the foundation. So, I mean, people forget how huge this country is, and now even more so, that, tell, you know, when I started in the business, 
the two no's, the two career, uh, the big <laughs> danger sign for a career was television in Las Vegas. You played Las Vegas at the end of your career because it was all about selling out in television, just never captured music. Saturday Night Live, I've watched for 30 some odd years waiting to see an act break, and it's never happened. It's somehow, uh, it, it probably ne it never happened up until eight years ago. TVs weren't stereo, the sound didn't come through, they weren't mixed by music people. Today, if you don't get on American Idol or television, you don't have a career. The quickest way to, to jumpstart a career is television. And Las Vegas has more major talent on any given night and on every week than any other place in America. There is, you know, rock venue. I mean, Vegas is uh, the most booked place in the country and is for every kind of act imaginable. So Vegas is, a, you know, totally turned around to being a place that embraces music. And the Palms just opened up a big studio there with a basketball court and, you know, who knows who's going to be recording there. But um, television is much more critical today. Uh, you know, it started probably through MTV uh, 10 years ago, but whoever thought that television would be the, the breaking point for an artist's career, but it is now. Um, so uh, it, it can make that foundation, <laughs> the first level of that foundation can be a TV show, uh, but it, it, generally not. You know, they still show up on Saturday Night Live and you don't see sales spike to any huge level on an album sale. Uh, American Idol clearly breaks uh, most of the stars that have come from that. Uh, and, you know, there's other shows, billboards, uh, the Grammys. Sales spike, but not to the level that it really you can point to that being the key point, uh, you know, of, uh, of sales. They're already established if they're on the Grammys. But uh, television is definitely a very real in ingredient in breaking an artist today. The agent isn't, however, managers are prevented by law from booking. So if you book your artist as a manager, you run the risk of the artist coming back to you and saying, you booked employment for me so I can break my contract with you. And there have been key cases where that's how they got out of their management contract by stating that they, uh, manager, in his, um, in the state's definition of a manager, it says you cannot procure employment. You have to go through a bona fide bonded agent that is licensed by the state. Now that license costs about $35, but you can't be a manager. So, I mean, there's no doubt that the first person on the team is the manager, the guy who believes, you know, you're spending all your time creating the music and he's going to spend all his, he or she will spend all his time promoting your career. That's what a manager is supposed to do. Promoting it to an agent, promoting it to a television show, promoting it to a record company, to a publisher, um, selling your wares. That's what he's there to do. Um, then after that, if you have a record deal, I mean, that's probably the key next step. Uh, publishing and record deals need to be aboard. And then the last step is an agent because you're really not going to, there's no need to work other than to build a base locally where you can hone your music and kind of fine tune it by having the feedback of an audience. You know, uh, a lot of bands find that. Uh, you know, 30 days into the tour, they're playing a much different set than they started with because they kind of read the audience and find out what they react to and how to pace it. I mean, one of the things I did as an agent, which is not standard, is not part of an agent's, you know, there are some people that just say, just book the dates. I don't want to see you. Don't show up. Uh, they close the door on you. Uh, that was frustrating. But there are a lot of acts that are like that. Then there's others that 
will expect you to show up, and if you don't show up, you're liable to lose the client. And they want the input, and they want to know why you picked this venue as opposed to the, the one down the, down the block or a bigger building. How come we, you know, one of the <laughs> typical calls one would get if a tour is not doing well, nobody knows I'm here. I've talked to all my friends in the city, and they didn't hear one radio spot. And, you know, the promoter, it's your fault for putting me with that promoter. And you'd say, well, no, here's a guy who said, Tom, I want to throw 50 grand out the window. Who can I buy and not advertise so I can lose this money? I said, never made sense, but you can't tell an artist that. You know, so you had to sit there and listen. Well, I don't know why. I'm going to get you, I'm going to find out. I'm going to check the schedules and see where he spent his money. Um, And the other one is, you know, if I would have played Staples, we would have sold out. But you put me in the forum, and nobody likes that building, so nobody, I had, you know, half a house. And sometimes there's validity in that, but not too often, and generally it's not a, a a giant swing. But an agent that can be brought in and you can hear, I mean, that was one of the teaching points of you have to stand up and give them the reason. You have to know every facility in the state that you book and why you chose that over the campus or why you chose going for three nights at Universal as opposed to one night at the Forum. You know, one night you're in and out and it's a big deal, but you can cause more of a press and media uh, spin if you stay and do three days at the Greek or, you know, do you want to be, you've played indoors, why don't we play outdoors, under the stars, makes it a different event. Uh, There's a lot of things that can be given to it if you're looking for longevity. If you're just looking for the quick kill, and today we're seeing, in the in the year we've just had, we're seeing artists who, who careers are two and three years long, and that's it. And, you know, it's flash in the pan, make a fortune, and disappear. Um, that really has never been... Uh, in the business, that's something that really is very rare. People would, you know, build on album one and the following, and people would follow acts for 8, 10, 12 years before they got to be headliners. Today, it's like instant hit, and as soon as they come out with the band, you can go from 8 million sales to 500,000, and those will have to be returned. So, you know, that's one of the problems that record companies have in planning their business year, saying, well, they did $8 million, we should count on at least another $8 million on the next record. Well, not necessarily today. So it's, uh, again, and if you rush to judgment, if you rush to make a record before you're really able to create the material for it, it's going to shorten your career. Be true to your music. Don't, you know, I think when record companies try to mold acts, I mean, it's one thing to develop an act and help them find their genius, but uh, I think artists have to... uh, I always felt very successful accomplishing something if I put two artists together and then I shut the door and left. Magic will happen. But if, if you try to direct it, enforce it, it's not going to, you know, people in a, in a vacuum go, God, wouldn't it be great if we put this one and this one together? No. Uh, it's got to come from the artist. Uh, today, I don't know. Uh, I guess I would say get a great manager because the business has shrunk to the point where there's only a few great managers that the record companies believe will make a difference. And a great manager knows how not to be lied to by a record company. Um, and you have to have a team. So it's got to be a guy that motivates them, not turns them off. Um, and that can't be the guy who was loading you the garage next door to rehearse in. I mean, it's a business now. It's definitely uh, a business, and it's, it's fed by relationships. Uh, You know, if you know the local people at radio, I mean, everybody 
has two businesses. Everybody, no matter what walk of life you're from, I believe has two businesses. Their own, if you're a plumber, that's their business and show business. Because everybody's got an opinion on, you know, that nephew of mine is a great singer. He should be in showbiz. And whether they're acting or whatever it is, people always inject their critique and say, you know, you should, everybody who's been on American Idol who you cringe with, some relative or somebody has said, you've got talent, boy, you should get on that TV show. Uh, so uh, you got to believe in yourself and then you got to get a manager who's going to make other people believe in you. And he's got to believe in himself. Uh, and today, that's very, very few people who are in the business and can call people and can get you to the right lawyer and get you to, you know, or can get you to one of three right lawyers, one of three right business managers. You know, I, I can give you chapter after chapter of artists who have made fortunes and are broke today because their business manager didn't do things right or they didn't allow them to do things right and invested on, you know, wasted, thought it would never end and kept spending and all of a sudden when it slowed down, they can't, you know, keep their way of life so they sold their publishing to keep their way of life for another two years and now they don't have any assets or any income stream. Uh, so uh, it's sophisticated and it's, it definitely has made uh, progress in becoming a real business. Uh, now it's got to make some inroads to go back to making itself a little more artistry. Watch this tape. Uh, there, there are actually a lot of, of opportunities to learn about the business. There's books, uh, uh, present companies, fathers who've written books. Uh, there's programs. A lot of universities have, uh, you know, actual courses on it. Uh, I, I would just venture to say that don't go at it haphazardly. It's a real business, and just like you go to trade school or you go to college and university to fine tune all your knowledge, get the basics. Uh, you know. You can go to law school and learn the law, but you still have to practice, and that's when you really... You, they give you the tools, but you, until you've really practiced, you don't know if you're going to be a good lawyer. Same with the entertainment business. There's books. Learn them. Read them. Study them. But when it comes down to it, uh, you have to get in there and shake for yourself and thank every person you come across because every person wants to say, I help so-and-so. Uh, the manager of Journey was a guy named Herbie Herbert. And every radio station in America has a Journey Platinum record on their wall. And every program director that Journey played in front of not only got the record, but got a handwritten note and would tell you that when Journey comes to town, they're my friends. They're going to come by and see me. And that goodwill made that band sell... 40, 50, 60 million records. Not that they didn't have talent, but they were also accessible. When the artist becomes not accessible, bad things happen. People assume that they are copying an attitude or they're too big for their britches, and this whole business is fed on people's desire to touch the people we put on pedestals. So the people that you meet on the way up You'll meet on the way down, and you might as well be friendly. It'll help you stay up there longer. I'm very happy. Um, I, and I think I said earlier, I, it ended very abruptly. And I wish it could have kind of slowed down and I could have kind of picked a stopping point a little better. But I think if I would have stayed in the business, I would have become very jaded. And instead, I can look back on 31 years and say I loved every minute of it. It was the greatest ride I've ever been on. I'm proud of what I did. It's great to see the people that are in it. When I bump into them, there's always... Uh, I, I think people knew that I loved the business and I loved being part of it. I was a people person, and, and uh, I think I contributed. 
So I, I feel good about that, and I, I feel that even if I would have stayed, I would have seen things that would have kind of made me that jaded, cigar-smoking, balding agent that was just taking my piece. And that's not what I wanted when I started, and I, I can smile and say I walked out uh, on top, and I, uh, today I don't think I could have had that same smile uh, in the business because it's, it's a different business. It's, it's got its challenges, and it's different. But the, you know, I came out of the 60s when it was kind of the age of Aquarius, and uh, I think everybody was a little idealistic. And I, ra I, I got to ride on that carpet a long time and turn it into reality for a lot of people. So uh, I was a dream weaver for a lot of music clients, and it feels good.